Today's sermon is entitled, The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived, According to Jesus. Luke chapter 4, Jesus went to his uh, hometown from verse 16. It says, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood town, home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim uh, that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Uh, he then rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, sat down all eyes of the synagogue looked upon him intently. Then he began to speak to them, saying, The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day, which is very dramatic. Uh, now, Jesus does something very interesting, though, with this passage. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, they didn't have chapters and verses then, but for us to be uh, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. But the interesting thing is he stops midway through a thought. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is reading a quote, but he stops in the middle of the quote. Uh, he reads aloud that he has come to declare the time of God's grace, the time of God's favor. But he doesn't finish the sentence that goes on to say, in the day when our God will seek vengeance. He stops it halfway through the quote. Jesus used his divine prerogative to stop halfway through the thought because he had come to declare God's time of grace but the time of judgment had not yet come. Isn't that interesting? He was coming to die for our sins. He was declaring God's grace. But when God comes to judge the world, that was still in the future. In fact, we're, uh, this is called the second coming, and we're studying that on Sunday evenings. And large portions of the Old and New Testament are dedicated to the second coming. Uh, it's not adequate to say, well, I don't have to know about these things because it will all pan out in the end. When God ends the entire Bible with a big book on on uh, the second coming of Christ, when the Old Testament is full, full of prophecy, you know, there's prophecy fulfilled in Jesus Christ, right? His first coming. But there's still prophecy in the Bible that's still coming, uh, that's still yet to be fulfilled when Jesus comes back again. So we're, the Bible has this in it, and uh, it's really uh, beneficial to us to study what God has prepared for us. So Jesus is, is talking to the people in Nazareth, and he says, I'm here to declare the time of God's grace. But this time of God's wrath, this time of vengeance, the time of the punishment that God will bring on the world, that's still yet to come. And today, uh, that's still yet to come for us when Christ comes again. Jesus is going to do something very similar in today's reading again. So Jesus is going to stop and not include a whole thought here. He's going to quote from several passages in Isaiah. He's going to bring thoughts together from several places in Isaiah, but he's going to leave out a key element and again, I, I think it was very intentional. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 says, When he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. This is written long before Christ, but talking about the coming of the Messiah. He will open the eyes of the blind, unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Isaiah chapter 42. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout nor raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. And of course, that's been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's message going out to every nation in the world now has a Christian witness. There's a church in, in every single country in the world. God, the Lord, created the heavens and stretched them out. He created earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to anyone who walks on the earth. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prisons, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor my praise with carved idols. Everything I prophesied has come true. And now I will prophesy again, and I will tell the future before it happens. Now Isaiah 
lived about 700 years before Christ was born, centuries before the message of Christianity, the message of Jesus Christ, the cross spread throughout the entire globe. The Old Testament, long before Christ, was prophesying in multiple places that God's message would fill up the entire planet. There's nothing like this uh, anywhere else in, in world history where you have something prophesied like this and it, and it uh, happens and goes throughout the entire world. Now, you could say it's self-fulfilling prophecy, and yeah, that's one possibility. Or the fact that it was prophesied 700 years, sometimes 1,000 years, sometimes even more uh, in the case of, uh, of Moses and Abraham, that this message would be a blessing for all people everywhere. There, there is nothing else like it that has ever happened. No, you could not take one person in world history who said something similar and it's come to pass now. So, yeah, it could be self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, momentum of belief, or I, I don't know what. But if there is one truth that's worth investigating, there would be none other than this. And this is a very clear evidence. God says, I'm the one who, who said these prophecies and they came true. And now listen, I'm going to prophesy again. And of course, it came true in Jesus Christ. Uh, centuries before Christ was even born, and then today, uh, well, we've seen throughout the ages the fulfillment of these verses. Now let's read uh, Luke chapter 7. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and we're going to be talking about uh, John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? Uh, if you look in Scripture from guys like in the Old Testament, like Moses and, and uh, Gideon and, and David, and then in the New Testament you have Paul and, and, and Peter and John the Baptist, God seems to like to use kind of rough and tumble guys. He uses some people with some sharp edges on them. And... Uh, John the Baptist was a fiery character. He, he, he gave up the privilege of his, of his uh, family. He went and lived out in the wilderness. He, he wore rough clothes. Uh, he ate some nasty food. And he spoke boldly. He spoke truth to power. He challenged the king. He, he challenged the whole culture that they need to repent. Repent is a religious word. Repent means to you're going your direction, and I'm going my way, and I think I'm right wait a second, I see God is real, I need to turn from my way and I need to turn from, to God's way. So it's, it's just a simple concept. When you hear Christians say, repent, 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 and the Bible say, repent, and Jesus saying, repent, it just means I was doing things my way, I did it my way because I thought it was right, but now I see God, God's opened my heart, and I'm going to change direction, and I'm going to go God's way. That's what repentance means. So let's uh, read now about uh, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, chapter 7 from verse 18. John the Baptist had a bunch of followers, and at this time, John the Baptist is actually in prison, and it's not going to end well for him. Uh, if you know the story, if you've seen the movie, uh, this gal does a hoochie-coochie dance. Uh, King Herod is pleased with it. He says, I'll give you anything you want. She says, give me the head of that prophet. And he says, well, okay. And uh, he gets his head cut off. And so it's not going to end well for John the Baptist, but he's in prison right now, and he sends his disciples. Now, John the Baptist had already seen Jesus. He had baptized Jesus, and he had said in front of a huge crowd, he pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which is a scary thing to say. A lamb in that culture was sacrificed to pay for sin. He says that's the lamb that's going to be sacrificed to take away the sins of the entire world. So he identified Christ as the Messiah, as a Savior. But now he's in jail. And he probably thought that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to establish a kingdom. He's going to set up a kingdom of righteousness. He's going to rule. Uh, because in the Old Testament, we see these, these dueling prophecies. We see uh, a coming Messiah that's going to be a suffering servant. He's going to be humble. He wouldn't even put out the wick of a candle. Uh, he's going to be soft-spoken. He's going to be silent before those who are going to kill him, and he's going to suffer for his people. But we also see a Messiah that's going to come in victory, and he's going to uh, set up righteousness. He's going to rule the world. And so they didn't know how to work these two. Uh, there were people looking for one or both. Some, there was actually some Jewish uh, rabbis at the time who were teaching there had to be two different messiahs. 
course, we know now that it's one Messiah who's coming twice. But they saw that there was these two dueling prophecies in the Old Testament. So John's wondering what's going on. I'm doing everything right. Doesn't it hurt when your life goes wrong and you say, God, I know I messed up, but my life's going wrong here. And, and even like when we get what we deserve, we don't really feel like we get what we deserve, right? But here John the Baptist gave up everything to follow Jesus and he's in jail at the hands of a wicked, wicked man and some teenage gal is about to get his head cut off for him. How unfair, how unfair to serve and live for God and your life ends up so miserable. So he, he starts to wonder and he sends his disciples and he says, uh, go ask Jesus if, if he's really the one. Look at verse from verse 18. John the, uh, John's disciples told him, uh, John's disciples told him uh, about all these things, calling two of them. He then sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or we should expect another? And Moses is not here today. He's famous for that line. Whenever he sees my dad, he says, are you the one or should we expect another? Uh, so John's disciples go to Jesus and say, are you really the one? Or should we be looking for another? Who, are you really the Messiah? We should we expect someone else. When they came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases. So they're there, but Jesus is busy right now. He's ministering, he's serving. Uh, it, he heals many people who had diseases, sicknesses, evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So then he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Notice, did you notice he talks about these kind of hallmarks, these symbols of Messiah? He talks about the blind seeing, the lame walking, the lepers being cleansed, the dead. Uh, I wrote the dead hearing, but that's not actually the way it happened. The dead being raised from the dead. The deaf hearing. Uh, the poor in spirit hearing the good news preached to them. But there's one key element throughout, it repeated again and again and again in the book of Isaiah, that Jesus does not say, and I think it was intentional. He doesn't include this in his message that disciples of John will bring back. He doesn't mention anything about the captives being set free. Isn't that interesting? John, John the Baptist is in jail. And Jesus says, tell him everything you've seen. And he doesn't quote any of the verses about the Messiah, about captives being set free. Now we know that Jesus did come. He did die to set us free from the captivity of sin and death. But he wasn't going to give that message to John at this time. What he does say and said, instead of saying, just hang in there, I'm saying all the captives free, what he does say instead is, and tell John, blessed is the man who doesn't fall away on account of me. In other words, you're about to go through a hard time. Don't fall away. Don't fall away. He's about to get his head cut off. He, this is not going to end well for him from a human point of view. Do you know what? We need to have a, a heavenly point of view if we're going to understand heavenly things. We need to have a spiritual mindset if we're going to understand uh, spiritual realities. So here's the situation. Unjust ill treatment. When we've been treated unjustly, it's easy to justify any sort of nastiness in ourselves, right? John the Baptist didn't do that. He kept his eyes on Jesus Christ. He kept his eyes on Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is in jail. It's not fair. It's not right. A teenager is about to do a dance that's about to let a stupid king uh, be the reason for a foolish king to cut off his head. There's nothing fair in this. There's nothing right about this. From a human point of view, John the Baptist wasted his life. He should have set, shut up and sat down. He should never have challenged the king. He should have never have, have, have shook up his culture by calling everybody to repent. But let's look at this from God's point of view. She says, blessed, happy, lucky is the guy. 
Remember the meaning of blessed? Who doesn't fall away because of me. John the Baptist sitting there. Hopefully the guy who cut off his head had a good swing, right? You don't want to go halfway. I mean, that's even worse. So he gets his head cut off. He wakes up. He's in eternity. He's standing before his Lord. In all of the trouble of his life, all the aches and pains that we all have, all, all the trouble that we all have, all the disappointments that we all have, added to that the unfairness of his life, the ill treatment he received from, from the authority figures who are supposed to bring justice. In the moment he woke up in eternity, it was more than worth it all. Being in jail, having his head cut off, being ill treated by people that were so immature, worth it all to be in the presence of his Savior. Blessed is the one who doesn't fall away on account of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, life doesn't always make sense this side. Jesus saw the full equation. We don't see the full equation this side of heaven. We, we don't know how all the numbers add up. It doesn't always look fair. It doesn't always look right. But for John the Baptist, Jesus knew everything was going to be okay. In fact, Jesus knew in a short time, he's going to be better than he ever has. You will be happy. You will be blessed. Remember, the word blessed actually can mean lucky. You're, you're a lucky fella, John. Don't fall away. Because he was about to wake up in eternity, and everything was going to be okay. We need to have a spiritual mindset if we're going to be, understand this life, if we're going to understand this world. We need to see things from God's perspective. And thank goodness he's given us this beautiful love letter. He's given us this book so that we can study and know how the world looks from God's point of view. Uh, from verse 24 now, let's read 24 through 27. After John's messengers left, so they leave Jesus, they're going to go back and tell John the Baptist about uh, the deaf, the, the blind uh, being healed, the dead being raised, the lepers cured, the message being preached to those who are poor in spirit. Uh, they're not going to say anything about the captives being set free. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. I like this. Jesus, God approves of John the Baptist, and God in flesh wants other people to know something. Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Because all Jerusalem, the whole community was coming out into the, into the wilderness to hear John's message. What did you go out to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Brothers and sisters, God tells us to set our face like bronze. Just make it strong. You stand in the face. When all culture is going one direction, when the whole world is running one direction, God's not impressed when we just wave and bend and go with the flow. A bunch, a bunch of our friends are foolish, and we just go with the flow. Everybody's talking this way, we just go with the flow. Everybody says, this is cool, this is okay, and we just kind of roll along with the flow because we've got no spine, we've got no backbone. God says he doesn't care. He doesn't want to see his children being just reeds swaying in the wind. He says, set your face like bronze. Be like a pillar. Stand against the flow. And God is telling these people, I approve of John the Baptist. Brothers and sisters, do you want God to approve of your life? At work, when you hear people talking badly about one race or talking down to women, in your neighborhood, with your friends, with your family, and they all start bad mouth and are going this one direction and you know in your heart this is not right this is not godly don't be somebody who just goes with the flow god god commends john the baptist because he's staying with god no matter what happens brothers and sisters don't you want god's approval on your life don't you want god to say well done we can't just go with the flow. Can't just bow to peer pressure. Can't just always take the path of least resistance. You ever hear people say, well, I guess it's God's will because it was the open door. 
Since when did the path of least resistance become our way of discerning God's will? God calls us to do difficult things. Sometimes he calls us to endure hardship unjustly. It's not fair, but the moment you step into eternity, it will be worth it all. So Jesus says, what did you guys go out to see? Just this reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? Some guy dressed in fancy clothes? No, those who wear uh, expensive clothes and in, in indulge in luxury are in palaces. And I, I guess that the idea here in, in Greek was, uh, was kind of a debauched lifestyle, a too, too fancy, just living for luxury. Uh, a man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it was written, Isaiah, in, in Isaiah, I will send my messenger ahead of you. No, I'm sorry, this is Malachi. I will send my messenger ahead of you and will prepare your way before you. Here, John, uh, here Jesus is quoting from this Old Testament passage, and by applying to these verses to John himself, he's also, this is a kind of in a, a roundabout way of claiming to be God because this is his messenger now, John the Baptist. Malachi chapter 3 says, Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you look for so easily is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies, which is probably an Old Testament way of referring to Jesus Christ again. He's the Lord of the armies of heaven. Now look from verse uh, 28. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow. I tell you, among those born of women, so out of all the Old Testament prophets, Abraham, Moses, uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jesus saying, John, King David, John is the greatest. There's nobody greater than John. John the Baptist was a great prophet. And remember I told you before, John the Baptist is, when, you st when, you, we, we started the, when we started the New Testament, we saw about John the Baptist and his birth, it really felt kind of like an Old Testament story. John the Baptist is our link to the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is coming, bringing this, the, the message of the cross. He's going to die for our sins. But Jesus says, of all those who came before, nobody's greater than John, but Jesus is bringing the kingdom of heaven. He says the very least in the kingdom of heaven is going to be greater than John the Baptist. Brothers and sisters, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you said, Lord, I'm messed up, I need a savior, God, please forgive. Thank you for that cross where you took care of my sins, right? If that's what you've done, you're part of the family, right? You're a Christian. You're part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. I want you to think about that. You ever think, well, I'm not such a big deal. I've got a little tiny church, or I, I go and, and not everybody at church even knows my name. I sneak out early. Or, 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 or you think, well, I, I don't have the talents like some people do that are singing in the worship team or whatnot. I, I'm kind of a low-key person. Jesus said the least person in the kingdom of God is greater even than John the Baptist. There's a commentary called the Hard Sayings of the Bible Commentary. Isn't that a, a good name for a Bible commentary? The Hard Sayings of the Bible Commentary had this to say, the least in the kingdom of God is the most insignificant person who enjoys the blessings of the new age of salvation that Jesus was bringing in. John was like Moses, who viewed the promised land from the top of Mount Pisgah, but not enter it. He's the last of the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11, who were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. In the Old Testament, all these believers were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, we live after the coming of Jesus. We live in the blessings of knowing God himself came down to take care of our sins. God came down to suffer for you and I. He wanted to take away all of our sins, give us eternal life. None of the Old Testament prophets had that. They had glimpses here and there. They, the God revealed a little bit to them, and they were looking forward to this time. Brothers and sisters, by faith in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit within us. God's given us a hope. He's given us a promise. He's given us a new life. 
That's something that in the Old Testament they didn't have. All the Old Testament was building up, building up, building up to the time when Jesus Christ was come. And we have this. And I've never understood why Christians say, I wish I lived at the time of the Exodus. Why? What good did it do those folks? They were, they were still fighting with God and running and rebelling. I, I wish I lived when I could see all these miracles. Brothers and sisters, we have the miracle of forgiveness. We have the miracle of the Holy Spirit within our lives. God, Jesus said, it's better for me to go back up into heaven <coughs> and that I send uh, the comforter, that he sends us the Holy Spirit. He said, Jesus says it's better than that if you remained here. Because when Jesus was here, you had to travel, you had to meet him. You're only with him part of the time. He was sitting right there. This is wonderful. But now we have the Spirit of God within us. Jesus says it's better. And I believe Jesus. All those Old Testament stories, even the stories about Jesus Christ, it's better to live now with Jesus Christ, his Spirit, alive inside of you. Blessing us, comforting us, challenging us, convicting of sin, giving us direction, helping us understand his scriptures, to have the Holy Spirit within us, which is freely given to all believers. Jesus says, I will give freely to all who believe. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, and we have the Spirit of God living within us. So, so John the Baptist was the last of what Hebrews 11 talks about. All these who were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. <coughs> Going on in the Bible commentary. It is not in moral stature that we're superior to John the Baptist. We're not more moral. It's not we're more devoted or we serve better <coughs> or in privilege. But those who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John. Greater not for... <clears throat> what they do for God, because in this John was unsurpassed, but for what God has done for them. On another occasion, Jesus congratulated his disciples. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> On another occasion, Jesus congratulated his disciples because they lived to see and hear what many prophets and kings had longed in vain to see and hear. That's Luke 10. We're going to be coming up to that later. It was not because of any superior merit of theirs that the disciples enjoyed these blessings. It is because they lived at the time when Jesus came and were called by him to share in the life and service of the kingdom of God. Even to be his herald and forerunner, as John was, was not such a great privilege as to participate in the ministry of the coming one, to be heirs of the kingdom which John, as the last of the prophets of old, foresaw and foretold. Uh, Jesus Christ just said something amazing to us, didn't he? The very least in the kingdom of heaven. Greater, more wonderful things have been done unto us. The things we've seen, the things we've experienced, the Holy Spirit within us, greater than even John the Baptist. So God affirms and he approves of John the Baptist because he was not just willy-nill and he wasn't just pushed around his emotions take him here one day uh his family takes him there one day uh culture says this is good so he says okay i guess it's good uh culture says that's bad and he says oh i guess it's bad you know jesus says go out in the world and tell everybody about his, his, his uh, message and make all people disciples right and our word says you can't our world says you can't share your faith these are two truth claims <laughs> and you got to believe one of them are we just going to go with the flow? Are we going to say, well, Jesus died for me. I guess he loves me. I'm going to follow him. Let's finish up for today by looking at 29 through 35. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purposes for them because they had not been baptized by John. This is uh, kind of what's called a parenthetical statement. It kind of breaks up the flow of the story, and Luke is putting in, inserting some ideas that he has here. Uh, it almost sounds like it was added in later, but all the ancient texts have this in there, the different streams, the different uh, textual trees. And so this is definitely part of the original text. And he, Luke is just giving his observation here. He says, tax collectors, these people, they heard, and they acknowledged that God's way was right. These people were baptized by John. And 
And, uh, but he says, but those Pharisees and those experts of the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Look at this. Really religious guys missed it. Really religious people missed God's purpose for their life. Wouldn't it be sad to miss God's purpose for your life? Just being religious doesn't guarantee that we're living out God's purpose for our life. The Pharisees, the experts of God's law, missed it. And boy, I hope none of us miss it. I don't want any of us to miss God's will for our life. Continuing on from uh, 31. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children. And he doesn't use the term here nicely. Sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, We played the pipe for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you said, He is a demon. The son of man, he's talking about himself, came eating and drinking, and you say, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. Uh, Sometimes people complain about anything. Uh, Music is is too loud one Sunday, and it's too quiet the next Sunday. Uh, It's... uh, They can't stand this person because they talk all the time. They can't stand that person because they never open up. (laughs) Jesus said... John the Baptist came, and he abstained, and he, and he was fasting, and he didn't touch wine, uh, and he, lived, uh, he went out from people, and he lived out in the wilderness, and people said, he's crazy, he's got a demon, he's possessed. And Jesus said, I came, and I'm friendly to everybody, and I eat with tax collectors, and people call me a friend of sinners, and I, and I drink, and I eat, and people say, well, he's just a, a glutton and a drunkard, Jesus says, which were not true, those are sins, and Jesus didn't sin. But Jesus says, no matter what, John comes to you one way and you criticize him. I come to you another way and you criticize me, no matter what. And brothers and sisters, we've got to be careful we're not like that. People that are quick to, we're just so quick to be critical that no matter which way things go, we'll find a reason to criticize. You know, you don't, there's, there's a few things in life. You don't even have to be a creative person. You can I mean, just a small glimmer of creativity, and you're going to find an excuse not to go to church. Now, Jesus said, let us not forsake the gathering together of the saints. Jesus died to bring the church together. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus loves the bride. If we say, I don't like church, what are we saying about Jesus' bride? How is he going to feel about that? But you don't even need much intelligence. You don't even need much creativity to find an excuse not to go to church. You don't need, you don't have to have much going for you to find a reason why not to read your Bible or pray. Just, a, I mean, just a mildly creative person can think of a reason here. And it's so easy to be a critical person. It, you don't need much wisdom. You, you don't need to be very clever. You don't need to be very creative. It's so easy to be critical about everything. And just, I don't like that, and I don't like this. But there's a real trick. And there's a real blessing involved to being able to discern God's hand at work, to find a blessing, to, to find God at work, to, to be able to, to say in this situation, how can I connect with God? What can I learn in this situation? How can I bring blessing to somebody else? Lord, I want to walk in joy, not in complaining. Lord, I want to walk in truth, not in self-deception. Lord, I don't want to be filled up with, with all sorts of nastiness. I want to be filled up with thoughts of you. These people, no matter what, how God brought them the message, well, that preacher's too noisy. Well, that preacher's so boring, he talks in a monotone. You know? It's so easy. You don't need to be creative, you don't need to be intelligent, but to, to follow the Lord, to find a blessing, and say, uh, I'm here to receive, Lord, and I'm eager, and I'm hungry, and I, I yearn for closeness to you. And Lord, I'm not here just for myself, but I'm here because I want to be a blessing to other people. And I'm not, I know my pillow seems awful soft, But how can I bless other people if I'm not here? Uh, We can miss out on God's will. We can miss out on the message God is bringing when we sit there. And instead of struggling and wrestling and being aware that the devil is scheming and trying to tear us apart, we just sit there and, and say, well, I don't like that, or I don't like that, and just fixating on the things we don't like instead of saying, Lord, 
what can you teach me today? What do you have for me today? Let's not be like these kids who played a pipe and, and you, while you didn't dance. And then, and then they, they play a dirge and, and why you didn't cry. They're always finding something to complain about. Let's not be known as complainers. Let's be known as people who surrender to the will of God. Say, Lord, here I am. Do with me as you will. Amen? Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we saw today the kind of life that God approves of. John the Baptist held on to God even when life didn't go his way, even when it's raining in the middle of the kitchen, right? Even when the hamster dies. Uh, we got to hold on to Jesus Christ no matter how many bills are piling up in our mailbox. Uh, no matter how sad. I mean, this life is a world of sickness. It's a world of death. It's a world of tears. You live long enough, you know the re prize for winning longest? You get to bury all your friends, all the people you love. This is, a, this is a sad world. This world at its best is a foretaste. At, when this world's really good, you're just getting a little taste of what heaven's going to be like. We need to live with a heavenly perspective. We need to see things from God's point of view. Don't go with the flow. Stand for Jesus Christ. And God, in, just like you do with John the Baptist, will say, I'm proud of this one. I'm pleased with this one. Let's, uh, let's stand with Jesus. Let's stand with Jesus. Hold on tight. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, here we are. <laughs> Father, we come to you with all of our weakness, with all of our distractions, and we thank you for your grace, that you're patient with us as we work through all of this stuff. God, uh, we don't want to be pushed around by our emotions. We don't want to be pushed around by our situations, by financial trouble or health trouble, Lord, or when things just aren't fair, Lord. But help us to see who you really are, to see you, Jesus, so that we will hold on tight. We will never let go, Lord. You say there's a blessing for those who see you and don't fall away. We don't want to be reeds pushed around by the wind. And Father, I pray that we're not people who are really skilled at finding reasons to complain. Rather, Lord, let us be really skilled at finding reasons to rejoice, to, to rejoice in you and to bring joy and encouragement to those around us, Lord. Father, thank you for the example of John the Baptist. Thank you for the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, not to be just people who hear these words and walk away, but people who put them into practice, who who build our lives upon these words, Lord, so that when life comes crashing in and things don't go our way, Lord, that we're not swept away, but we stand with you, doing everything else, Lord, to remain standing. God, thank you for these people. Thank you for this church. Please bless us. And God, today, help us to be very intentional, very purposeful about being a blessing to other people, Lord. And Father, I pray that you set a fire in our hearts that won't go out, Lord, that we'll live for you, that we love you, we love your holiness, Lord, and we love to tell other people about your son, Jesus Christ. Pray all of these things in your name. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.